you know in horror films where it goes boop, 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 boop. I just did that. I was like, <gasps> Hi, I'm Andrew Trendle, you're watching Enemy, and we're here with Natasha Khan of Battle for Lashes. Hello. How are you today, Natasha? I'm good, thanks. Um, so I understand that you're living in LA now. Yeah, I've How? been there for two and a half years. And you're about to release your fifth album, Lost yeah. Girls. Fifth album, that's like entering institution territory. <laughs> Basically, I'm old. <laughs> no, 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 what I mean is like, fifth album is like... You could release the greatest hits if you want. I have a body of work, <laughs> definitely, yeah. No, it's been, I think it's been 13 years I've been releasing albums and um, there was a, I also did like a side album called Sex Witch, so it's actually, it's like six albums now. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's like my most fun, sort of happy, liberated album, maybe because I've just been doing it so long, I've just sort of like, have no inhibitions, <laughs> <laughs> just let go. So, I mean, after that many records, how do you challenge yourself? How do you say, this on this record, I need to do something I've never done before because you've never made the same record twice. No. But how would you describe your approach to this record? I think moving to California definitely um, inspired, and not a new sound, but I think it brought out some aspects of my music musicality that I kind of hadn't really pushed before. Um, and I think it's because moving to LA, I sort of felt like I was in all these Steven Spielberg films and 80s kids films that I loved so much. I felt like I was actually living inside them. And it started to really bring back loads of memories of all those synth arpeggios and like beats and Madonna and, you know, Lost Boys and things like that. So um, I think also because I finished my 10 year deal with Parlophone, there was a bit of a liberation and I just, I was like, I could just make anything now. I just felt free. Um, and not having a label sort of needing you to do anything was quite, quite liberating. Hmm. But I mean, you felt so free that you didn't feel the need to make an album necessarily. Um, Cause it started as a script. Or, yeah. No, it started as a soundtrack idea, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I think with most albums, I start them as like a film idea and I'll write a script or a narrative or a story. And then I start to flesh out the soundtrack in my mind and that usually becomes the album and it happened again with this one but this time I was talking to production companies and like I'm sort of working on a feature length script for the story um, but as always the music just comes so quickly and easily sometimes it sort of becomes an album but yeah I think I'd, I'm still working on the film. Mm. Oh, so there is going to be an accompanying film to I go with it. I hope so, yeah. yeah. I don't know if it will be accompanying because films take so long, but eventually there will be a debut feature film. And how would you describe the kind of um, visual language? Because when I think about these films, I'm th you can either think of kind of the John Hughes direction or like The Dark Crystal, which is underrated and terrifying. Oh, it's so good. But you strike me as someone who both of those kind of avenues appeal to. Yeah, I think the, there's definitely like the romance aspect or the amazing 80s rom-coms but I think my genre is more the phenomenal like the alien and phenomena aspects so I love poltergeist I love E.T. I love the Goonies I love I love Karate Kid which which is, isn't phenomenal <laughs> <laughs> it is phenomenal <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, yeah I think there's there's sort of like a little group that I've held really close to my heart for a long time oh, what was it Flight of the Navigator Flight of the Navigator is amazing. <laughs> Never ending story, obviously. Flight of the Navigator, Dark Crystal, Labyrinth. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of those weird puppet animation, like Terry Gilliam sort of English films as yeah. well that were quite strange. And always incredible soundtracks. They were always married together. Because like, yeah. I can't tell you about the music of, I don't know, Toy Story 2 or whatever. Or, no. And also CGI has ruined kids' films. Let's it be real. Has. <laughs> Yeah, because I think in the old days they used to paint backdrops and have sets and have... E.T. was like a big brown, like, mm. animated <laughs> alien that was really rubbery and strange looking, but he had a soul <laughs> and he was real. Um, and, yeah, I think there's something about things becoming so slick and, like, massive and big production that takes away from a lot of that homemade DIY sort of creativity. Like, I read a lot about Steven Spielberg because I like... 
I like Stanley Kubrick and Steven Spielberg as directors and David Lynch and I read a lot about them. But he said that the reason Jaws was so successful is because they tried to make an animated, like an animatron great white shark and it was so bad mm. that in the end they just used the fin and they never really showed the whole shark. But that leaves so much more to the audience's imagination. You're imagine imagining something terrifying yeah. just from seeing this fin like going into the water. So I think just being um, minimal can can be really magical. And the album's also great because you're kind of you're playing with um, sort of little touches of you can hear little touches of kind of um, sort of cinematic stuff from the '80s films. A little bit of Depeche Mode, a little bit of Bowie. Did you ever want to just completely lose yourself and go full on Saint Elmo's fire? <laughs> Definitely. I mean. <laughs> Do a power ballad and like crying in the vocal booth, but one leather glove like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I think even if I wanted to go full, full power ballad, I just can't help it. Like I have to have some darkness or weirdness in there. It's just my taste, and I think probably so good on this album is like the clearest. It is a banger. Thank you. The clearest, <laughs> like you know, Mad early Madonna style eighties dance song. Um, but it, I still couldn't do the full like yeah <laughs> sort of thing on there. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> maybe I should have went, worn like a leather bodysuit and just like permed my hair. It might have helped. Yeah, <laughs> net lot of netting everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Dry it, smoke and netting. Yeah, but and netting was really itchy. <laughs> um, so what can you tell us about um, the adventure that plays out for Nikki and the Lost Girls across this album and the arc of the story? It's basically about a girl, Nikki, who um, is obsessed with sort of um, alien phenomena and sightings and unusual, you know, weird things happening. And she meets a boy who lives in a town that's being terrorised by this gang of mystical girls that ride bikes and come from the desert. And they together sort of do this Mulder and Scully investigation trying to find who these girls are and what the sightings are and stuff. And so they're driving around LA and they fall in love um, and, and basically she ends up being captured by the girls. So she, they think they're hunting for the girls, but the girls are actually hunting them. And then it's her journey of being whisked away and getting involved in this gang and like what powers she gets from being with them. And I guess the, the soundtrack is kind of a soundtrack to falling in love in LA with peachy sunsets and driving along the beach at night and making out in the car and like all those things. But then there's also the shadow of the Lost Girls, which are, have that very sort of vampire-y, dark, 80s, more sinister element. And, and yeah, if, if I was to make the film, I guess that would be, those songs would be in the soundtrack. Mm. Have you ever seen an alien? I haven't seen an alien, but I have had a poltergeist experience. Oh, really? That was quite scary. I was recording in a studio in deepest, darkest wheels. And um, I was in a weird, they put me in like this weird, small, outbuilding because I thought it'd be nice for me to have my own place to sleep and I was terrified <laughs> and it was pitch black and in the middle of the night I just sat up with a start because there was a massive crash and I went downstairs and there were speakers that were on this sort of deep shelf speaker hi-fi system was across the other side of the room Whoa. with all its wires like pulled taut and it was just there and I just you know in horror films where it goes boop 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 I just did that I was like <gasps> and then tried to wake up my producer at like three in the morning to come and get me. Yeah, you didn't stay there. I didn't stay there. I don't usually, I'm usually quite not that scared, but that really was unexplainable. Mm. And um, last time we spoke, you said that you were drawn to artists like Kurt Cobain and Joni Mitchell because of how much they gave to themselves and left on the record. Do you feel as if there is still a lot of you on this record or is it pure escapism and fantasy? Oh, there's lots of me on the record, definitely. I think... Every record I make is really personal and it's because I like using narrative and storytelling and characters and archetypes and creating my own mythology. I think people might think that that's less personal, but for me, I, I can actually go deeper when I'm using characters and um, the relationships between them. You know, I can kind of really access deep parts of my own experience because it, there's a freedom in it not being so up close to, to your own sort of confessional, personal way of doing it. So, um, and I think this album is probably a part of me that's really fun loving and I love dancing and I love, yeah, you know, 80s films and music and 
having fun and going out driving and you know there's a lot of energy and like happiness to this record that is probably a side of me I haven't expressed as much in the past. Mm. And um, so is the live tour, because obviously the concept of the live show has always married the record, is this going to be dry ice, disco balls? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, keto. <laughs> I think... Um, is no, keto, like this part of the keto, what does that do? I think you can... <laughs> Yeah, I actually just think you just hold it. Is it just for holding? Um, it and there's there's the keys there. Or maybe those are the buttons that change the sound. Ah, oh, right, right. Something like that. I probably have to investigate. Yeah. I haven't got one. <laughs> not yet. Um, not yet. <laughs> but yeah, I think um, yeah, I think the the first tour that we're going to do will be really stripped down. We played Maida Vale yesterday and did like a really stripped down version of Kids in the Dark and the Hunger, and it's all synths and voices and quite sort of intimate and emotional and I think we'll probably do a we'll probably do one like that first and then maybe next year I might get a bigger band together that's more loud and epic for festivals and stuff but we'll see. And you've covered uh, such a wide spectrum of sound already but is there anywhere you're really itching to go in the future? Um, I think I'd was like to gnarly. go yeah I love doing sex switch that yeah. was really liberating and raw and and psychedelic which I like mm. I kind of like the idea of combining that psychedelic rawness with a re the really hard 80s or 90s like club you know like um I can't really explain it but in LA there's a lot of bands that are doing like very sort of like oh like health like, like yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. like very sort of distorted driving elect like quite dark warehouse electronica I really love that music and there's some bands that are really inspiring. They sort of sound like David Lynch, like Julie Cruz, like singing over the top of something really heavy. I think that could be really fun to try. Yeah. And um, congratulations on your Ivan Novello for your work Thank on, you. again, Requiem or the Requiem? Just Requiem. Just right? Requiem, yeah. yeah. Terrifying show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that was fun because I, I went to LA to sort of think a lot more about doing film and I'd love to soundtrack a horror film or a a weird, you know, cool film, and um, and so doing Requiem was nice because there was a lot of um, themes of cults and strange goings on, and I got to make some quite sort of yeah dark horror sounding music, and then to be to be acknowledged at the Ivan Novello is obviously always really nice, but for not doing albums, that's that's nice. I've got one now for Daniel and one for. For that, so. What are you talking about your work away from Bat Flash? What else is going on at the moment? Um, script writing. I've I've um, illustrated a children's book that I'm hoping to put out. Um, I do lots of painting and um, yeah. I guess I'm just always I'm always writing something or drawing something or making something. I can't really stop. So maybe now the music's done. I think my my inclination, my first thing I'd like to do is to really push the directing because I directed both of these videos that just came out and I loved it so much. I really enjoy that <coughs> aspect of yeah, being behind the camera as well as in front. So. And as for musical collaborators, um, Let's Get Lost was one hell of a tune. Thanks. Queued up to buy that record store day. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember record stores? <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> uh, plans to work with Beck again or are you just mates? Well, we just, I just sang with him live on the James Corden show. Um, we did, he did a song for that film, Roma. Great film. Called Tarantula. And um, I think it's a cover, actually, of a Cocteau Twins, maybe. Um, and we all sang with the LA Philharmonic Orchestra um, on TV. So that was really nice. He do, he say, we stay in touch with each other. And he, he um, texted me a few weeks ago saying congratulations on... Um, the Kids in the Dark song because he loves it and so he's really nice and yeah hopefully I'd love to do something again Let's Get Lost was so easy and so fun to do and we were talking about this this just came up to my head because we were talking about this um, the other day about how we're approaching the end of the year and the end of the decade yes is that scary to you how would you how would you <laughs> define this decade what will you remember this decade for well I guess this decade has been most of this decade has been music for me um, and I, I suppose this decade for me has been the rise of social media and the internet and just kind of it's it switched from one way of living into kind of a different way which when I look back as an old lady I think I'm going to be quite sentimental about the years before that 
And then I'm interested to see how far technology pushes us in the next 10, 20, 30 years. It's been a weird decade, full of ups and downs and all the beauty and all the misery and all the light and dark, I suppose. But yeah, I think just in terms of the way the world's gone, the technology has been like an overriding noticeable, noticeable difference. But you're approaching 2020 optimistically. Um, I think so. I think on a, on a personal level, I'm the happiest I've been and the, the least anxious. <laughs> Although the world is kind of rising in anxiety, I feel like maybe there's sort of a, um, a maturing and just like kind of settling down in myself. And, and just on a personal level, looking to, for, you know, more milestones, but for me, rather than my career. So, you know, if I have, have a baby or do something like that, I think that's going to be the next frontier that I have to deal with but creatively I feel stronger than ever and, and very excited about the next decade because like you say I've sort of I've been around a while and then suddenly you sort of find that you've got opportunities and experience and you know what you're doing and you can kind of hopefully flourish um, in in other areas or just in music still which is a wonderful note to end on Natasha Khan thank you thank so you. much for your time thank, thank you, you.